Good day, good evening, and good screaming. I am Jello Biafra, and this is Renegade Roundtable. And speaking of some of America's all-time greatest renegades, this episode's guest is somebody I first crossed paths with when he and his then sidekick were on a very mixed kind of a bill that turned out to be the last Dead Kennedy show at UC Davis in California. The first on was Frank, the Jewish lesbian folk singer. And then I think this next guy was next. I'd heard the name, had no idea who he was. And he basically sat down, played a guitar, you know, it did a lot of satire and put a TV on his head for a song called Stuffin' Martha's Muffin. MTV, get away from me. I thought, okay, safe cop college humor we do mtv get off the air god damn it seven seconds played we played mojo was very friendly we got to know each other a bit and they even spent time in denver and knew the same people from the denver wax track store that i did and even had a punk band there we ran into each other again i think at a butthole surfer show we were all on in buffalo new york maybe some other things and just started going to his shows and then eventually he shows up and his sidekick who meant so much to the show skid roper was gone and instead there was a whole band i later found out was called the toad lickers and they were all iconic mutants basically especially the wild as hell piano player who was also had jerry lee lewis level moves fingers to go with it you know he could have been vladimir horowitz he could have been billy preston but he was pete wet dog gordon just raised the energy to a whole new level and then i think it was the same show he at one point you know and the audience was a lot of it was a college audience even maybe on the surface a jo male jock audience but we loved him i was there and a lot of call and response at a mojo show ollie north ollie north says the crowd jubilantly and i thought oh damn him is an asshole silence and i thought wow we're more on the same page than i thought and then maybe 20 minute la minutes later came this long half singing half talking version of what should be the america's national anthem this land is your land and it's not for people who own it and it's not for people who fenced it i didn't know about the other verses because that was what Woody guthrie was saying but wow he has much more of a heart in the same place as me and i ran backstage told him how much i loved the show and before i knew it his manager who calls himself bullethead calls my guy greg workman at alternative tentacles and wants to know if i will make a country record with mojo and the result was prairie home invasion still in print everybody on alternative tentacles records a so-called alt country now they called alt country even or americana and i i personally thought that album came out really well lots of fun adventures and getting and no mojo all the more and then um what happens but he gets this great big country broadcaster gig with sirius and even a talk show called lying cocksuckers which i have been on and kept wanting to get back on but they said oh no they canceled me again as soon as trump got on they threw me off for good so i'm hoping what we will have today is the passing of the torch and the heir apparent to lying cocksuckers plus there is now a documentary movie out made by his bassist earl b freedom finally finished called the, the mojo manifesto it's a beautiful piece of work the pre-Mojo Nixon years, you know, make me love the man all the more. And without further ado, the my favorite lying cocksucker himself, Mojo Nixon. Hey, Jello, how you doing, man? Well, obviously, I'm really happy to see you, happy to have you here, even if I have to see you on a screen and instead of the same room. I mean, you don't You, you know, I, I, I want to say uh, on Stuffing Martha's Muffin, I was saying music television should be covered in jism. So I wasn't going as far as you, but you left it. Music television should be covered in jizz. I'm going to have them, you know, sing that and chant that. No, I learned a lot about the mojo vernacular and ways of words, as well as, um, you know, the way you and I saw things a lot the same, but from very, very different places. I mean, there was a there was a review of Dead Kennedy's plastic surgery disasters in Trouser Press where they said, Jill B. Offer has no sympathy for the common man. 
And I thought, damn right, they were all bullies at school who wanted to bully me into becoming more common and get rid of my hippie hair and this, that, and the other. But then from where you came from and the Hamlet chicken plant disaster and what I was also getting from Daryl and Judy and Earth First, we did Where Are We Going to Work When the Trees Are Gone? And of sympathy for the actual timber workers and stuff. And I, 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 I gained much more of an empathy for what many people now call the common man or worse yet, just Mrs. Flyover States. And you live in Cincinnati now, right? You're not in San Diego. I'm in Cincinnati. Or- you know, I, I always, uh, early on, I wanted to be Woody Guthrie, you know. And at some point, I wanted to be Woody Guthrie. I also wanted to be Joe Strummer. I wanted to be Bruce Springsteen. And eventually, I had to be me. But but those are all all part of the same idea. You know, we're gonna, you know I, I'm for the working man and fuck the bosses. The bosses can lick my hairy asshole. Can we say that on this show? <laughs> Dump. The, oh, well, this is my show. I don't have to answer to anybody from Sirius uh, or anybody well, let else. Me, let, me, so, let, me, I, let me tell you about Lion Cocksuckers, uh, which is that, you know, called Lion Cocksuckers. It was a great show. I said every, everything I wanted to. And now they're paying me not to do it. Yeah, they. <laughs> I, it's in my contract. I just signed a new contract for two more years. It says, you know, political talk show Thursday night for, you know, one hour. And they're paying me not to do it. That's how that's how radical the show was. Who else did you have on besides me? You know, I had like Kinky Friedman on and just you know people I knew. Uh, right. You know, uh, I remember that guy uh, from Rolling Stone, Matt Taibbi. I had him on. He was a political writer. Oh, lucky and, you! I've always wanted to meet that guy. Yeah, he was a good guy, and I and I had a bunch of you know, and I and I had a bunch of. I remember there was a guy I did a whole book on uh on the original uh heart on the national lampoon and i you know because you know national lampoon is kind of an un you know people remember animal house but they don't remember the subversive nature of national lampoon magazine in the oh, early right. 70s yeah, I me and you are the same well. age right so yeah it's this but i would have you know different oddballs and weirdos and nut jobs on and uh but mostly and then every now and then uh this is my proudest moment well, about once every quarter, instead of doing lying cocksuckers, I'd do turd talk. Turd talk was men talking about taking a shit. But the women would call in, too. And I can't believe they let me. That This was the idea me and Country Dick originally had. Somebody offered us a radio show in San Diego on 91X, the alternative station. This was like in 1990. And we wanted to do turd talk. You're on the bowl. That's, the, that's how we we're going to answer the phone. <laughs> I mean, I remember that from when we recorded together at Arlen in Austin, Texas with Stuart Sullivan and the Toad Lickers. You would often give a scientific analysis, you know, a yes. special re- news report on the shit you just took. Yes, you know, yes, you, you were been, very analytical. This has been going on my whole life. Right? I've, I've had whatever that irritable bowel thing my whole life. Now, booze and drugs are not help. You know, let's, let's you know, and, and my diet. You know, deep fried pork is not helping. But uh, I've had, you know, uh, bowel problems forever. I was trying to remember, when did we make that album? What year did Prairie Home Invasion come out? Was that 93, 94, maybe? I think we made it in 93 and it came out in 94. So it's coming up on its 30th, 30 year anniversary. Good God. Is that right? Time fries when you're overworked. What can you do? (laughs) Or overindulge. I want. are you do you do you like that album? Yes, I do. I was frustrating. Uh, you know, I'm used to being in charge, and you're used to being in charge. I was frustrating. I know. Uh, you know, so it was, there was a little head button there. Oh, I know. But, I could have but, been better about that for sure. I know. Right, but, I and, uh, well, I got a. I, I could have too. But uh, but the point being, I yeah, I like it sonically. I mean, we got you know, not only is me and the Toad Liggers playing way above our heads, we got some cats who could really play to come in there. And that raised oh, yeah. that raised everybody's game, right? Oh yeah. Well, it was interesting. Instead of what I later found out was a Segovia of the banjo, the new or the modern Earl Scruggs, Danny Barnes, he played and laid down some guitar because Paul Leary recommended him. I had no idea about his banjo skills, and the banjo guy you brought in, who did a perfectly good job, coincidentally was the owner of the South by Southwest festival oh, yes. at the time. So. That's how Mojang got his gig at South by Southwest. <laughs> yeah. now, you remember we played? We played a gig. We played one gig. Yeah. Prairie Home Invasion at Liberty Lunch. Uh, Lewis Myers, he was the guy you're talking about. I'm sure right, he's the one right. who put that together. I tell you, Thank you, that, you know, I, I remember that gig. After the gig, I had such, I was trying to remember that your songs don't have the regular Chuck Berry changes. 
So it was hurting my brain to remember how all those songs went. And uh, I, my brain hurt so bad, I couldn't get high. That's what happens when in his head with his voice makes up songs. Yes. <laughs> well, and I remember I came up, I went up to your house in, uh, in San Francisco. And you oh, would yeah. kind of, you know, hum it. Part of the problem is I'm not really good at like, if I lit, hear a song on the radio, I can't just figure it out right away unless it's a Chuck right. Berry song. So I'm sure right. I fuck you had ideas in your head and I fucked them up on my guitar. <laughs> not entirely. No, 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 no. I mean, granted, one thing that I big mistake I made was I was also trying to combine it with, I always wanted to make an album with Evan Johns, but by this time his drinking had become so extreme we had to take him back home after the first day of basic track yeah, no, he and couldn't, so he's not he couldn't really figure out what key we were in what he couldn't get the guitar right. in tune he he was not doing yeah. he was not well, doing more, well. more to the point i mentally was trying to get other people to substitute for that part of the what i thought the sound should be and i thought later you know this whole back porch hoedown thing you did for let's go burn old nashville down there should have been more of that if I just listened. So, uh, but overall, you know, here we hey, are. We... I can't believe we're both alive. I can't believe you're alive. I can't believe I'm alive. Yeah, and at this point, I'm no longer thinking I'm going to be dead by 25. I'm going to be dead by 30. I can't believe I'm, I can't remember how you old you are now, but now I'm right at this male menopause crisis age where a certain horrible Paul McCartney song won't leave my head. So I just turned, I think maybe I was born in 57. I think maybe you were born in, in 58. 58. Is that right? Yeah. 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 So yeah, you're yeah. a year younger than me, but yeah, we're, we're all, we're, we're all old, you know, uh, uh, it, there's not, there's nothing, nothing we can do about it. Well, except mentally it, it's a, one of, one of the great saving grace is we're both in some ways, completely immature spoiled brats <laughs> and that keeps no, I, keeps I, us from feeling i'm like that a old. giant 12 year old i'm like a 12 year old <laughs> you gave adderall to thinking it would calm him down it didn't calm him down just made him you know made him a bigger pain in the ass yeah my father was a mental health professional as well as a rock climbing pioneer so nobody ever put them drugs in me but now, but to the, for the Mojo Manifesto movie, it, it's streamable, right? You can access it and watch no, it. No, not yet. It. There's still, uh, it's taking, you know, there's a bunch of legal stuff you have to do to you know, get oh, clearances right. on a movie. Uh, Earl Freedom, the bass player, is taking care of that. Uh, Jello is in the movie and uh, comports himself quite well. And the movie should be out. The movie survives in spite of me, basically. <laughs> what I want to get to, well, I mean, it, 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 well, it also, it, because you hear the word, oh, oh there's a, mo a movie about Mojo Nixon. You think, well, it's just going to be all fucked up. And then you hear the bass player made it. Then you think it's really going to be fucked up. But somehow he made a good movie that connects with people. And kept I told him you just have to capture the essence of Mojo, the mojosity. And I think he, I said, don't, don't, don't try to make, you know, don't try to make civilians like me. Make the fans happy. And you know, I think that's what he did. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's been so long since you put an album out, your fan base basically is what it has been, but it's still wide. And the, the, what I love about that movie is it fleshed you out more as the warm-hearted human being I love so much and even more than I'd had before. So I'm going to start. Now I finally get to my usual opening question. What created you? I think, uh, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. My mother is, my parents grew up in the depression in small towns in North Carolina. And my mother in particular was desperate to be middle class. You know, she, she lived, uh, she had a good life. You know, she wasn't dirt poor or anything, but they had a, you know, they had an outhouse when she was a little girl. She did, my mother desperately wanted to be middle class. She wanted it to be the Donna Reed show or my three sons. That was, you know, her idea of what middle class was. And, and no copperheads and, and, what, and moccasins and, in the outhouse. Yes. And so she, but the thing, the thing she worried about, the thing where we diverged at, at a young age, she cared desperately about what the neighbors thought. She would say, what, you know, you can't do that. What will the neighbors thought? What will the neighbors think? And I finally realized, fuck the neighbors. 
give a shit what the neighbors think. You know, I fucking hate the neighbors. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not interested in being in their club. Right, their club. How old were, were they, you? Were this, they, how old were you when you had this revelation? This is maybe, uh, maybe twelve. I remember I was. I told my father I wasn't going to go to church anymore, and he said that's fine. But if you don't go to church, you don't get to eat. So then I started thinking. I was like, well, okay, man. <laughs> I gave the youth sermon and I read Bob Dylan's uh, "The Times They Are Changing." With class, I mean, I, here's here's what most freaked my mother out. Not that, not that, but the fact that I had on plaid pants. Apparently, God, their invisible friend, doesn't like plaid pants. <laughs> <laughs> you, the, they might be in for a surprise. Who knows? I mean, I'll bet Jimmy Swaggart liked black pants. Yes, Jimmy, plaid so, pants. Well, and here's the thing, too. I mean, if there's a heaven and a hell. I want to go to hell. You know, Country Dick's down in hell. Hunter Thompson's in hell. Bob Mitchum. Bob Mitchum's definitely in hell. I want to go to hell and play cards. The devil has a big card game on Saturday night. I want to be, I want to go to the table. Lee Marvin, you know, Lee Marvin's there. Oh, yeah. Um, For those who don't know, Country Dick Montana was Mojo's late best friend and a fellow, fellow wild man who, uh, was mainly the drummer and occasional front man with a very low singing voice in the Beat Farmers, the guy with the longer blonde hair and often with a with a hat. And there was also briefly a, a kind of a a super group, maybe a stupor group in real uh, in real life called the Pleasure Barons. Then it meant Country Dick and Mojo were in the same band, and it also <laughs> meant Dave Alvin was there, and Rosie right. Flores was there, Katie right. Moffat was there. And mm-hmm. when I met Country Dick, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I, uh, I, I used to be in a band called The Penetrators, and we opened for Dead Kennedys at the Skeleton Club the first time he played in San Diego. That was cool. I mean, one of the great regrets of my life was that, you know, I heard so much about him. I knew how tight you guys were. And then finally, the Beat Farmers come to Slim's in San Francisco. And for some reason, was, oh, I'll see him next time. They tour a lot. And then by the time the Beat Farmers got to Calgary, Country Dick dropped dead on stage. So I no, never Country got Country Dick see. was also in the Crawl Daddies. You know, the Crawl Daddies were one of the original 60s right, punk bands right. right in San Diego. And I was in the Crawl Daddies for like a half a minute. Uh, didn't do any recording. They they got rid of me. I was too rambunctious. But Country <laughs> Dick was playing was, the drummers in the Crawl Daddies. Was Mike Stacks on the Crawl Daddies, 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 Daddies too? Yes. He, Mike Stacks was in the Crawl Daddies. Yeah, my, when I was in it, Mike Stacks had just come over from England, and it was Ron, Ron uh, Silva, and Mike Stacks, and some guy playing piano who was out of his fucking mind, who was kind of <laughs> reminded me of Wet Dog. You know, what you talked about Wet Dog, my piano player. You know, there, there's a lot of Jerry Lee in there. There's a little Sun Ra, and there's also, there's a, a lot of Terry Adams from NRBQ. You know, and, and he's, he, uh, you know, I'm a ham. Wet Dog's a bigger ham than I am. He's not even touching the piano. He's just over there doing things. Well, in the studio, he blew me away with how many other things he could play and how he was coloring songs with an organ, even the sarcastic version of Love Me, I'm a Liberal we did about Clinton people without having to change any of the words to this day. And he did 70s FM radio organ just so nauseatingly beautifully it was perfect for the song oh wow this guy has such a wide palette i mean that was another major motive the the pleasure barons are going to reunite on the outlaw west cruise you know i'm on this channel sirius xm outlaw country and we've done some cruises and they're doing a west coast one has all the west coast bands on it uh you know social distortion and x and the blasters and los lobos and uh, you know, all those kind of bands. Wow. And anyway, so everybody's going to be there except Country Dick, uh, John Doe, Rosie Flores, Dave Alvin, me, Steve Berlin is going to play with us. And uh, we're going to do a tribute to Country Dick on the cruise. I've been having to relearn all those songs here recently. When is, when is that cruise? The cruise is in three weeks. Wow. Uh, because just now, the members of the band are starting, are, I get emails, oh, what that song in? What strings are we using? You know? <laughs> awesome. Okay, well, back back to what created you. You talked a little bit about your mother. One one, one thing that blew me away in the movie was your father. Yeah, see, my father was kind of a. Uh, I was very much. I'm very much my father's son. My actual name is really uh, Neil Kirby McMillan Jr. Uh, you know, I look and sound exactly like him. Uh, you know, it's a genetic thing. He was loud. 
and, you know, outgoing and like to have fun. And, uh, but he was also, you know, a Southern liberal in a small town in Virginia where I grew up, Danville, Virginia. And in, in the movie, my dad had a, a column at the weekly newspaper, and there was a Nazi, a guy with a Nazi armband outside with a sign that said, who needs Neil McMillan and the Jew press, you know, and sent him, I don't know if this is in the movie, but sent him a back to Africa ticket. Like the Klan had printed up these tickets to send liberals back to Africa. So, uh, you know, I, I grew up, you know, that's part of the, the one thing that bothers me a little bit about the movie is, uh, you know, it kind of makes me look like a do-gooder. It makes me look like, when in fact, it's really my dad. And my grandma, they're, they're, they're the do-gooders. I'm just the inheritor. In, okay, inheritor you called your, bra- your grandma the Eleanor Roosevelt, not just of Danville, Virginia, but of the whole South, and then didn't explain that. When she won, she kind of looked a little bit like Ellen. Okay. She, she dressed, she uh, and, fa- and physically she looked like her. And, and But she was a liberal, too. She had gone to college. She grew up in Brunswick County down by the beach in North Carolina. She went to college. She was a school teacher. And, you know, and and she and so she was the same kind of liberal uh, in the 30s and 40s that Eleanor was, you know, and, 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 you know, and my dad picked up on that. And my uncle, that's another thing. My, uh, my dad, desperately, my uncle, both two of my uncles are lawyers, and my dad wanted to be a lawyer. But I was born. He had to go get a job. He had to go get a job. So their dream, my parents' dream, was for me to go to law school. And since I was such a good bullshit artist, they thought, well, he, yeah, he, you know, he took monkeys out of the tree. It won't be a problem. But that wasn't my dream. My, my dream was to rock and roll. My dream was to somehow combine, like, like I said, The Clash and Chuck Berry. You know, that that was my dream. And then and then, uh, and then it was made easy. When my father died, he died at like age 48, you know, when I was 20. When he died, then I realized, oh, I don't. I don't have to live his dream. I can, I can, I, you know, I, I can go do what I want to do. Oh, I'm sure he'd be very proud of you probably by the time you were 21. But uh, in, in the movie, and you talked about him when we were just hanging all, all those times, he was also um, worked at a radio station. And wasn't it a uh, black gospel station? Yeah, it was at? a soul station in the 60s. You know, so uh, James Brown, Sam and Dave, you know, Smokey Robinson, Miracles, that, you know, was one, two, three. And he was involved in the civil rights movement uh, there in Danville, you know, which is one of the, you know, it was very segregated at the time. And, uh, and you know, and the, you know, there weren't many, there weren't many white businessmen there. They, you know, it's, it's a, uh, you know, it's a cliche, but it was literally my dad and the Jewish guys who owned the haberdash, you know, the fancy clothes joints. They were the only white liberals to, you know, align with the blacks. Other people might have had sympathy for the blacks, but they were afraid to show it. They wouldn't, they, they were not, they would never, you know, put their head on the chopping block. What I, I don't recall hearing in the movie was, although I should have known, the presence of the actual clan in Danville, which meant you probably knew who some of the adults around town were who put the hoods on and maybe even who in your school was sympathetic to, which would be oh, well, a really, really tense thing to grow up in. Well, this is, it's even, it's even more so. Danville was the last capital of the Confederacy. You know, it's mentioned in that song, the night they drove old Dixie down, uh, Virgil King worked on the Danville train. So when Richmond fell, Jefferson Davis came to Danville and set up shop for like a week, uh, you know, be- before, and this, that's right at the time of Appomattox. So anyway, Danville's claim to fame, Danville's claim to fame was it was the last capital of the Confederacy. And in 1965, they all the men grew beards and rode horses down Main Street in some attempt, you know, to say, we're going to keep the Negroes down, which is, you know, which is what all this was, what it was all about, you know, always. And it, the other thing that happened in Danville is, that, you know, it was a cotton mill town. And so every time they would try, this was in the 40s and 50s, every time they tried to unionize, they would use they would use race to split the vote. Right. So they would, some, you know, they would literally dynamite people's houses and stuff. But they would also, you don't want to be in a in a union with that guy. Right. That guy's right. You don't want to be in a union with a black guy. Except they didn't say black guy. But there, there, there was even uh, an incident or probably a culmination of many incidents 
where there was an honest to God African American uprising in Danville, photographs of which are in the movie, with the identical hosing of African Americans that uh, went down in Selma with John Lewis and everybody. And it happened in Danville too. Yeah, Danville was yeah, Danville was known, you know, as one of those places that you know it wasn't safe to be a black guy, right? You had to, you know, you had to be your had to be you know on your best manners. And there was a uh, like I think I said in the movie. There wasn't a black guy on the city payroll in 19 city, 1960. The one third of the city was black, not a black guy on the city payroll because those jobs are for white folks. Not even a black garbage man, not a black policeman, not a black gardener, nothing. Wow. So what exactly caused the uprising in the streets and were you there? No, I was too little. This was in 63, 64. Martin Luther King came to town. I just remember my dad was uh, riled up. And at some point, Somebody put like a upside down uh, Johnny house, uh, you know, on our front yard. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why. And I don't know what you that know, is. What's a Johnny house? A Johnny, you know, an outhouse. Okay. Somebody put up. Right. But it was, that was some symbol, you know, say, you know, right. My dad was thought of as a traitor to the race. Right. But he thought of himself as a guy that wants, you know, I, and I firmly believe this. Everybody, we should bring everybody up to the good level. You know, we you know, uh, we do more we do more good by you know raising a bunch of boats than by raising one. Right. No. Fully, fully agreed on that. Leveling the playing field, raising the boats. Did your father actually meet Dr. King or see him speak? Yeah, I think so because there were some pictures down in the basement of my house, and uh, we were literally getting the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was his main organization right. with Ralph Abernathy. We right. were getting their weekly or monthly newsletter at the house. So, you know, he was involved. Yeah, that that's the part a lot of people don't know about you. But somehow, um, when did you first get hooked on rock and roll? Well, uh, you know, shortly <laughs> shortly thereafter, might have bought, you know, I, I had a bunch of singles when I was a kid. I, I remember I had uh, the Beatles' Help single. I, lo I loved uh, Help and I'm Down on uh, the B-side. I had singles as I was a kid. But I think that I went really crazy when I bought that second Led Zeppelin album. So when ah. it was, that was like 1970. I was right. you know, 12 or 13 years old. Yeah. yeah I, I would I play like a whole lot of love years. just over and over. Right, you know, just, right, right. right. It was I know a that secret, one. Right. And it was also, it wasn't, it, you know, this is kind of part of the mystery of rock and roll. It was, Led Zeppelin wasn't on the radio. We only had was AM radio then. So right. it was like a little secret teenage, you know, thing. And that's one of the things that rock and roll does. It's a secret language between the musicians and teenagers about what's ha what's really happened. That right. was uh, my buddy Jim Dickinson. He would go on and on about this. His, you know, he felt like he was transferring the secret history of rock and roll to people like me, with hopes that I would spread it. And you know, because <laughs> there's all there's always pop music. There's always schlock. There's always terrible stuff. But there's all but some if you dig deep enough. There's somebody playing the real thing. There's somebody playing something that, you know, is exciting and meaningful and wild and crazy and free and, and, and it'll move you. You, you must just might have to just dig to find it. Well, yeah, am, yeah, am I, I talking don't... too much? <laughs> oh, not at all. No, no, no. This is, this is a little bit different from what you said in the movie, which is good. And a lot of people haven't seen the movie, of course. And somehow, even with Reverend Horton Heat and yourself and others, and then Many, many more, including Brian Setzer, they didn't start out playing more traditional rock and roll and then making it their own. There were other things, too. And in your case, um, you, at one point you were in Denver and really, really into punk rock and started a band whose name I keep forgetting. I'm sorry. As Zebra 123, we were a good, we were a combination of The Clash versus Jerry Lee Lewis with Richard Pryor. Uh, singing that was that was my plan <laughs> well Dwayne Davis never forgot it one of the co-owners of Wax Tracks he always asked me about you and stuff and I guess there were recordings now, is, and is, is, is he still around network. is Dwayne yes, still is. around yeah I would know I was there I, I was there last summer and I uh -huh. went by there but he wasn't there yeah he doesn't come in that often anymore and his partner, who was the real encyclopedia of all the old 45s and all those genres we love, um, Dave Stidman, 
he comes in once in a while and then his son has now moved back from the east coast and there's another stidman kind of slowly taken over for dave and stuff i mean dwayne well, that, and this is i know this is one of your joys right that we would go, go to the record store and spend hours looking for things we didn't have well and, I, know, with a look, store like that especially when i opened the pandora's box when i had to start buying 45s because of all the punk singles that you'd never hear any other way and right. the original wax tracks probably had more of those maybe than anybody outside of bleak or bob or zed on the coast or whatever i don't know tons of stuff and then there was this huge table of used old 45s i've resisted this i've resisted this oh here we go and within five minutes i found out one but four singles by the colorado garage kings i used to hear on the radio who played led zeppelin also and who i thought was a black soul singer at the time just like this guy named credence clearwater another early favorite didn't know it was a band but not one but four moonrakers singles I've got a Moonraker thing. I don't believe it. So then I started finding more stuff. And Wait, then there was you, no you, thought Fo you thought Fogarty was a black guy from Louisiana? Yep. I didn't know where if he was from. It was just with that voice. And, you know, it, it, it's not inconceivable for an African-American to be named Credence Clearwater. There's an <laughs> no, Eddie Clearwater. Well, and, you know, and I, and, you know, I love Fogarty, uh, even though he can be personally a pain in the ass. I love, I love those records. And, but yeah, oh, yeah, there's a lot of Little Richard in his singing, and a, and there's oh, yeah. a little Howlin' Wolf in there too, right? Yeah, yeah, not as much Howlin' Wolf as there is in Captain Beefheart, or for that matter, you at times. But oh, uh, yeah, that you know, I really can't sing, but Bell, you know, I I could I I I, I could have been one of them singers before they had microphones. I, I, oh yeah. I could have taken Al Jolson on. <laughs> there, there you go. Or, or or been a later version of Emmett Miller. Nobody, you oh, know yes, about I, Miller. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, I read the Nick Tosh's book. Now you, have you read that book? It's about Miller or one of the one of his other ones? No, there's one about Miller called Where Dead Voices Gather. And it's wow. all about uh, the last of the black minstrel singers and how right, that, you know, right. right how, you know, how, how maybe rock and roll begins during the, before the Civil War with you know white guys pretending to be black guys and black guys pretending to be white guys and you right, know it all gets mixed together right. and i was just talking about this on the radio today when chuck berry did maybelline and showed up to some of the early gigs they thought they were going to see a white guy because it's kind of a country jump song you know yeah same, and he, and also has a, he also doesn't have a stereotypically black singing voice either no he doesn't and, and it, well the opposite is true jerry lee would show up and people thought, well, he must be black. <laughs> he he's yeah. just crazy. <laughs> well, he also, of course, as you know from another Tasha's book, spent a lot of time peering through windows to the in the clubs that had what was called race music at the time, right. complete with chicken wire across the front of the stage because people threw bottles at the musicians and stuff, which happened to him later too, and he was kind of used to it i suppose i mean i i was told about emmett miller by glenn howard who you may also know i'm not sure um i know john doe knows him and the alvins know him and whatnot but um big record guy 78's collector he uh he um gave me a cassette of emmett miller and said yeah this is to jimmy rogers what you know jimmy rogers was to hank williams Emmett Miller was right. to Jimmy Rogers. That was the way he presented Emmett Miller. And I think you were the one who told me that bluegrass was originally invented by African Americans. Lot of, lots of people were playing similar music. You know, Bill Monroe, you know, gave it the name and popularized it. But a lot, a lot of the, in the twenties, those a lot of those string bands, you know, were black bands. We put a lot of labels on things. But to me, I, I like the Duke Ellington quote. I like there's two kinds of music: good music and bad. I like good music. <laughs> and, and, the other, and the quote I always you know, we, you know when you're recording the microphone doesn't know what color you are the tape doesn't know what color you are right exactly. what matters is right can you make people can you make people buck dance can you make people feel something in their soul <laughs> you know, that, 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 right, that, that's that, hilarious you'd bring that up because we were trying I think it was uh, will the fetus be aborted our cover of Daryl Cherney and Judy Berry's yes. parody of and oh, so appropriate now. There's a video out now that Annie, the co-producer of this show, made. I think I think I sent that to you of Will the Fetus Be Aborted because of the Supreme Court situation. But the tempo wasn't quite 
feeling right, and we all knew it. Well, let's just try it again. He said, wait a minute, wait, you just can't buck dance to it. You got up off the chair where you were all mic'd up with your guitar and began buck dancing around the room until, yeah, this is it, this is it, and plopped back into the chair and Wid, otherwise known yeah, known as, uh, God, how can I space on Wid's name? That's uh, Mike Middleton. Well, that's Middleton. You're getting old. I mean, you're not as old as me, but you're getting old. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, Mike anyway. Middleton. Apologies, Mike, but but then he he locked in with the buck dance beat, and that was the take we used. We didn't record another one after that. Yeah, that that that's you know very extremely appropriate now with uh, the whole situation, you know, with the uh, Supreme Court. Oh, absolutely. That was thirty years ago, and you would think all these you would think all these problems from the you know fifties or sixties or you know eighties or nineties would be solved. Nothing solved, you know. In, oh, in fact, know. Donald, I mean, Donald Trump made it worse. Right, Donald Trump being president meant that uh, people could people could tap into their inner jerk and what whatever hate filled psycho feeling yeah. of you Come know out neglect of the they had. A complete but, asshole in every possible way, and then it's okay. But well, I I think going going back to you know, the heartbreak, looking back on how we both felt things were really going and how exciting it was to be as aware as we were. And a lot of other people our age were not. They have no tangible personal memories of Vietnam, civil rights, or even Watergate when we were in high school. And Senator Sam and those hearings were the best reality show in the history of television. And Nixon went down. Justice actually worked, at least before Gerald Ford. By the by the mid to late 70s, when I was about to get out of high school, and a lot of things suddenly just changed in a year or two. All of a sudden, instead of being practically defunct, the frats and the sororities were back at the University of Colorado, and suddenly ROTC was back, and suddenly were people were getting really, really square, and the music that most people knew about and listened to was getting really, really sucky and everything. And then Journey. instead of like... I, the, the band I hate the most, Journey, I fucking hate Journey. <laughs> That I, I, at the time, I liked their first two or three because they were more of a prog rock band, and there was right, right, no right. I, I, Perry. Yeah, I saw that. Right, that when they did uh, the they did a cover of the Beatles song, uh, "It's All Too Much." I saw that, but yeah, when they when they yeah. got the pop singer, uh, you know that that's the devil. That, I mean, know, I, I had already Reagan. long long unplugged from there because you know the main thing that kept me from being a seriously suicidal teenager who couldn't even kill himself right finding out the hard way it was when punk hit and suddenly the spirit of rock and roll was back the music was as wild as the mc5 and the stooges and the lyrics were all sick humor and negative and angry as never before and i think punk and then all the things that spawned with post-punk and the revival of true roots of rock and roll and all that stuff all those years that we all loved and you 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 wouldn't be mojo nixon without the clash either you know all these things you went through that was the only stuff that made the 80s bearable i mean the sensational 60s then the sober 70s when suddenly the way to be naughty was to drink a bunch of cans of beer in the park with the jocks instead of you know that's rebellion please get away from me and then but the 80s my old friend John Greenway from Colorado said, yeah, well, now what we're living in, it's not the sober 70s, it's the evil 80s. And at Reagan, again, you know, greed is good. It's okay to be a crook again. And Nixon was fine and all that good stuff. And slowly a whole army of Nixons in both parties takes over all the echelons of government. But what made it bearable and what made it good and did so much for the magic, it was the music, very much including you. Know. you. One it, of the, it, uh, you're reminding me of one of my songs. Uh, I ain't gonna piss in no jar. Uh, oh, I ain't yeah. gonna pee pee in no cup unless Nancy Reagan's gonna drink it up. And I think I they don't uh, remember that line. Oh uh, yeah, that's the uh, first line. That's the first line. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and but the um, I ain't gonna pee pee in no cup unless Nancy Reagan. And I think they re put out Broadside Magazine and uh, like. Like Bob Dylan, I was in Broadside Magazine at some, you know, reissue point in the 80s. I was very happy. Yeah, I don't know what Broadside Magazine was. Well, Broadside, so there was uh, there was Sing Out Magazine. Right. Th these are folk. This is New York folk stuff. Right. And then right. Broadside was more political songs. And in fact, Dylan did a song for a Broadside album under the name Blind Boy Grunt. 
Not that I'm oh, fixated yeah. on Bob Dylan. Not that I that's all I ever think about or anything. <laughs> you know, somehow I, I didn't all... just get the new Grail Marcus book about Bob Dylan. But anyway, yeah, Broadside Magazine was a uh, a broadside, as in a political broadside. So right. like so, right. Bob Dylan's third album, The Times They Are Changing. Uh, you know, and that's you know that's also you know Phil Oaks, the guy we covered on the thing, and we kind of made Phil, Phil Oaks. Really sound, are. We, well, we also made Phil sounded like he was at Motown. You know that that made me feel good too. You know. Yeah, you and Wet Dog are the ones who pulled that off. I didn't have any any strong ideas on what to do with the music to make it different at all. And then that happens like, oh, yeah, this is the kind of FM stuff that the love me, I'm a liberal types who think Bill and Hillary Clinton are awesome to this day. This is about them now, and I hardly had to change any of Phil Oaks's words. I mean, clearly, musically different. But punk spirit goes back way before the Ramones, the Sex Pistols, or even Iggy Pop. And Phil Oaks was punk spirit to the nines. Definitely. You, know, uh, definitely. you, you talked about uh, when punk came around, I was talking about my mom, you know, and one of the one of the things punk was saying was, we don't care. We don't care about your all all that shit you care about. We don't. Right. Because I always felt like there's, you know, you're selling two things. One of them is we don't care, as you can hear in the second. And then all, the other thing is fuck you, fuck you, <laughs> fuck you, you fucking fucks, you know. And uh, and then there, I guess the other side of that is you know, uh, is, is you know we, you know we we there we, we don't want to admit it, but we do actually care about some stuff, and we want to be well, united, united so. and we want to kick some ass. Yeah, I mean, I obviously. Uh... You know, even though they bought way too much of the rock and roll hero thing from my taste, it was obvious that people in the Clash gave a shit and the Sex Pistols gave a shit. And in their own way, I mean, Johnny Ramone denied to me in a letter that the Ramones were a political band, but certainly the kind of stuff they were singing about, nobody else was singing about trying to turn a trick right, at 53rd and 3rd or right, any right, of that. Right. And it was, it was, yeah, it sometimes was sometimes it's political without being overtly political. The right. fact that they topical. made those albums, right? The fact that they made those albums was fucking subversive, right? You oh, know, yeah. It, oh, yeah. So somehow we rewind back to Danville, Virginia, which is right above the North Carolina border, isn't it? Real close. It's right on the North Carolina border. It's below Roanoke and Lynchburg in Virginia, it's above Chapel Hill and Greensboro in uh, North Carolina. At some point, you know, you're exposed to all this civil rights consciousness, and there's all this, you know, you feel it when you're walking around, not just on the streets of what's going on in Danville, but of course, you and I both were aware enough, we experienced the situations and the music together as one, and it enhanced our knowledge and ability to feel both, of course. So at some point, it goes to a later uh, picture of you in the movie, and suddenly you've got long hair. Were you the first one in Danville to grow your hair out? And the the bully. No, I wasn't the first, it? but uh, the the 60s were a little slow coming to Danville. Right. You know, and uh, yeah, I came home from college. I went to college in Ohio. I came home from college, and my mother thought Ohio. I looked like what? Uh, Miami <laughs> of Ohio in Oxford, oh, okay. Ohio. Which was right. about, I guess, the reason I went there, it was the furthest away place my parents would pay for, maybe. Uh, you know, right. I figured it was, it was like a 13 <laughs> hour drive. There's a little chance it's going to be a pop in. And um, anyway, I went there and I didn't know nobody. And I was the only punk rocker there. I was an army of one. And, um, right. but I came back and I had really long, crazy hair and a beard. And my mother said I looked like, uh, the, I look like the man who killed Miss Shepherd. So, you know, the fugitive story is based on the actual Dr. Shepherd who uh, supposedly killed his wife. And he said there was, he, he claimed, I don't know if you know this, but he claimed there was a bushy headed man on the beach that, that killed his wife and beat him up. Right. And she thought yeah. I looked like the, the mystical bushy headed man. There was one of those in, in Boulder where I grew up who finally got released about 25 years later named Joe Sam Walker. And in his case, it was a stocky blonde they never found. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But yes, uh, it's kind of, you know, it scared my, uh, it's, uh, scared my parents to death and i was all i was already i had a band going i had a band called godzilla's revenge and then i had a band <laughs> called martial law and i and martial law was all like 70s 
you know, radio rock covers Stones, right, right, uh, Skinner, right. you know, Bad Company, that kind of thing. But uh, I made them learn Blitzkrieg Bop, and they didn't want to. They didn't uh -huh. want to. But yeah, when you get that drum going and everybody starts going, "Hey, ho, oh, let's go," you know, it, it's infectious. You can't, you can't stop it. Just ask any gazillion dollar sports team you care to name these days. You know, to have that people chanting that in the in the in the stadium. I mean, it's mainly football, isn't it? For hey ho, let's go. Yeah, a lot of times you know uh, they'll play it during the during the kickoff there, or or when somebody's starting off, whatever. Anyway, um, it's the other thing that I think is very key you haven't hit on that you hit on strongly in the movie is if those of us who know you well or have seen you enough on stage didn't spot it about ten seconds. You were exposed. You you were raised in the church and exposed to fire and brimstone preachers, either in your church, family's church, or around town. I, you know, uh, the church I went to was pretty. You know, was the meth the high Methodist. It was pretty safe, pretty you know. Right. But uh, but my dad, you know, worked at the black radio station, and they had churches. They had preachers live at the radio station and on Sunday from their. Oh, okay. I remember I went to go set up the microphones once when I was in high school, and I, I was going. They got a drum set, a bass player. Uh, they got nine tambourines, and they got you know a guitar player, a, an organ, and a piano. You know, the church had a rocking setup, and I always oh, yeah. loved. And they, you would see them on TV all the time. I remember. There was a guy, some crazy preacher, had a show on the TV ch channel out of Greensboro, and he was all over the Beatles. He knew that Paul was dead, and the Beatles were the devil. And, you know, it, this was in 66, I mean, 67 or 68. Do you remember his name? Was he white or black? He was, he was white. I can't remember his name, but I would have never heard, you know, I was like 10. I was 10 years old. I would have never heard any of this, except he's telling it to me. He's telling me I, how Paul's really dead. He's overdosed on drugs. I may already have a record by him in my crazy preacher department. I don't know. Is I it Jack, you might, you might. Jack Van Impey? Is it Mark Rude? And years before he haunted us all, and he was already extreme fundamentalist and had that operatic, let the eagle soar voice, John Ashcroft put out an album oh yeah that guy yeah oh, that yeah. guy yeah well and on on one of my songs i'm going to dig up how the wolf i mentioned dr gene scott i don't know if you oh, remember yeah. him oh very yeah. well he was, very he was, well he was, he was completely nuts <laughs> and then yeah. and then there was that guy in uh there was a guy in dallas who i think maybe those uh sub genius people put farts to you know you know the, that tape oh, yeah. i'm talking robert about? tilton Robert Tilton. Robert Tilton is a he would do this thing and then oh, like, oh, he, oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, but I think it might have been those sub genius guys, Reverend Stang, uh, you know, down there in Dallas, who put farts to it. Oh that, that was a good tape to have. You know, that it's yeah, crazy. I, I, I got that off this. Al Jorgensen at one point, that tape. Yeah. Well, it, you know, we, now you go to the internet and you can find anything. Back then you had to like you had to talk to people, you had to go places, you had to you had to stay at the party till 4 a.m. to get to see the farting tape. You know? <laughs> yeah, and I, I have video stuff I've never seen on the internet that if you're ever at my house again, then uh, you have to see this one. Yeah, what, what? The Lightning Hopkins teeth flying out. Have you seen that one? No. Uh, I think, uh, who's that guy that played? Uh, um, Dave Alvin got it from... Um, Al Cooper, uh, okay. I think. Okay, but uh, anyway, Lightning Hopkins is doing like German TV. And he's playing the song and he's sitting down and he's like, you know, stomping. And at the end of the song, he goes, Hoo! you know, like that. And his false teeth fly out and shoot across the room. And then the guy comes on and goes, let's see that again in slow motion. Because you can't really see it at first. Wow. Oh, yeah. okay. So, so of course, uh, people with fond memories of the heyday of you and Skid Roper and the Toad Lickers, obviously, you're very high energy, very physically fit. How early... Were you that fit? I mean, when did the long distance bicycle trips begin? When I was I was a bicycle racer when I was in high school. And then wow. uh, I think, and then early, let's see, in 82 is when I rode the bicycle across the country. And uh, and part of it was, and that, I think I stole a lot of this from Bruce and from, uh, uh, you know, George Thurgood. I'm not that good a singer or player, 
but I'm going to, you know, I thought of it like a football game, you know, I was going to, you know, and, and this is before I got old and fat and, you know, and fucked up and drugs, and booze and everything, but yes. So I would, uh, I would compensate for my, it, my lack of musical ability by one, making it like a physically uh, exhilarating, exhausting thing. And the other thing, my real talents into bullshit, you know, the stuff, it turned out like when, you know, when Skid wasn't, when Skid wasn't around or when Wet Dog wasn't in the band for a while, people didn't get upset. People came to hear the shit I said between the songs. And the less often, the less often you gigged, the more the fire and brimstone Jimmy Swaggart with the guitar got more intense, more insane, and of course, more dead on in the thought department. But the story I want to get to, the long distance bike ride across the country, was how and where and everything that led to the birth of Mojo Nixon. So uh, let's see, this is 1982. Uh, I'm in, I'm in since, I mean, I'm in San Diego. I've met Country Dick. He's thinking about forming the Beat Farmers, but he hasn't yet. He's got Country Dick and the Snuggle Bunnies. And I'm kind of at a loss. And, and it, uh, you know, I don't know what to do. And I had always wanted to do this, to ride, go on an adventure, ride a bicycle across the country. My uh, childhood friend from uh, Danville, Bobby Parker, he said he'd do it. He was a park ranger somewhere. And we, uh, we started in San Diego, rode bicycles all the way to Danville, Virginia, hit the ocean at excuse me, at Savannah, and uh, we slept outside or asked for people, you know, we didn't we didn't pay for a motel once. People let us stay in their houses or in their backyards or in the park. You know, a lot of times you'd see like the roadside table, picnic table. We'd go there, set up, a cop would come by. He'd be ready to roust us, but then once he realized we were on an adventure and we were leaving the next day, he okay, all right, y'all can go, y'all can stay. So yeah, it was, and it was on that trip that I kind of had the Mojo Nixon revelation that I should, you know, stop trying to be Bruce Springsteen and do what I do best, which is sit down, get a front porch boogie woogie going, and then start talking shit over top of it. Right, that you know. Well, p- part of it also what you told me when you first told me the story, and uh, when we were making our record, was it wasn't just any place you had this epiphany. It wasn't sleeping under the stars. You were drinking in bars at night while riding these long distance bikes and somehow mm-hmm. having the constitution to be and metabolism to well, we do were, that. And it was we, at a we bar were, uh, in New Orleans that Mojo yes, we had was a friend in New Orleans. I had a friend that was a bartender there and he took us on like a tour of all the bars and we were drinking <laughs> something called Skylab Fallout. So this is when oh Skylab God. was falling back to the earth and okay. uh and then, you know, and I was just drunk out of my mind. Uh, I remember the next day, I think we only drove, we only rode to uh, Bil- Biloxi or somewhere. And I, I was a little hung on, a, a little bit. <laughs> but you, so you weren't drinking every night when you, when you. Pu- no, I wasn't stopped. drinking every night. But so, but yeah, this, uh, this friend of mine from college, he, he got a job in the bars and he goes, I'm going to take y'all to, you know, so he's a bartender. He knew all the other bartenders. He took us to like 20 different bars. Bobby got so drunk, he swallowed both of his contact lenses. Right. He didn't, oh, my God. He, he, <laughs> How can you swallow your contact lenses? You he sneeze them to, out like lightning Hopkins? He was Hopkins. trying to save them. He was trying to save them in his mouth or something. He was trying to put them in a glass of water, and he ended up swallowing them. Right. And, well, the, the moral of the story there, always carry chapstick with you. You can always get the chapstick out later, even if it's gas permeable lenses. And oh, this um, is this I, is your this is what you've done. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. During, right, during the if you're doing the walk of shame at 7 a.m. and the church bells are ringing, you can find your contacts in the chapstick. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't put them straight in though, or my eyes would just hurt like hell from all the debris and scum in there and um you've got glasses on now were you wearing contacts back when you were in your 20s it wasn't uh no, i didn't have you know here's the thing oh, the, you know who thought i'd be dead by now the long-suffering bride of mojo mister <laughs> they you know i promised her i'd be dead by 40 i remember i uh I had to, I had this whole thing. No oldest male child in my family had ever lived to be 50. You know, I didn't think I was going to outlive Elvis. Uh, this is all just kind of, I've been, and if you saw me it, whenever I was at my worst, you would have said, he got like two weeks. 
he's got two two weeks and then he'll be dead. And I I wonder well, you know you know why I'm not dead. And I remember I asked I you know I I think I asked you know John Doe John I said, how come we're alive and you know other folks John Doe said we we were smart enough to know when to say no. But Dave Alvin said no we were just lucky to have the good gene the you know the hard to kill gene. Right, you know, and, and I think that is a lot of. I, I think know. there may there may be both. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Keith Richards, Jerry Lee, and Al Jorgensen. Every day they wake up in the morning, they're defying science, right. and I suspect they all know it. I mean, Al does for sure. So, uh, and he and and he's down to alcohol. The powder is long gone, thankfully. But uh, okay, so Mojo Nixon, the concept is hatched. What made you move to San Diego in the first place? Why San Diego? Oh, I, had, I had a girlfriend from college. Uh, she was okay. out there, but she's the one. She was going to law school out there, and she's the one that told me I needed to, you know, go, I needed to go to law school so I'd have something to fall back on because this music thing was never going to work. So I wrote a song <laughs> about her on my second album. You're going to eat them words, you know. <laughs> oh, but then so it was a few albums later when you opened. Didn't you open an entire album with "Destroy All Lawyers"? Oh yeah, so I did, right. They they you know you know that was, like I said that was my parents' dream that I should go to law school and everything. Right. And once I realized because by the time I was halfway through college, I I was done with it. I was sick of it. I hated it. I hated it. I hated everybody there. I wanted to kill everybody and everything. I was some kind of, you know, hillbilly, hillbilly Midwest punk rocker. But I, you know, they spent all this money. Okay, I'll graduate. But then, but then when I graduated, I moved to England and I lived in a squat in Brixton. And my goal was to join the Clash. I, I met Strummer later through the Pogues. And he said they were all full. They didn't need me. They, they didn't need me at all. <laughs> yeah, weirdly, when I didn't want to cut my hippie hair off yet, after my fear and loathing backpack trip to... London in 7 or 77, and I saw the Saints, among others, and whatnot. I still didn't want to cut out. I said, oh, wow. I listened to the first Motorhead 12-inch called Motorhead. I was like, God, maybe they need a singer, man. That guy can't sing to save his life. <laughs> that guy's kind of gravelly, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, his thing developed a little more after that, but and I, of course, I didn't get it at that point either because Venom had not completely changed metal by becoming the flipper of heavy metal where all of a sudden the recording was terrible they could barely play the guy couldn't sing to save his life instead of the falsetto judas priesty stuff and all their songs were out satan and angel dust what more could you need i mean i hadn't i'd ignored metal except for motorhead for years and then venom hit was like oh my god who is this and of course a lot of the classic metal people and, and the best they just hated them instantly especially after they got a cult and got popular and then another band comes out of southern california called slayer who leapfrogs them almost overnight and you know it has you know, you know the musicianship the production everything is on a whole other level and plenty of satan too you can't go you can't go wrong with bells above bells above is a good move i even have a, i even have a barber shop or a glee club album i found a thrift store and the name of the group is the beelzebubs but i haven't had the I, the song titles well, do not indicate this. that they're singing yeah, let, let, satan yeah i'm going to interview you how many albums do you have i stopped counting probably in ninth grade 10th grade so, it wasn't quantity it was quality it was the music every damn one of them i bring home i get them because i want to listen to them then when i'm home i gotta get back to work so how many uh is there a warehouse is there walls of albums or is there a basement room You've been there and yeah how I mean, many the living room are there is... more sing are there more singles than there are uh, albums? Quite possibly. I've never checked. <laughs> I'd have to pay somebody to work work at a decent wage for a month just to count them all, let alone catalog if, them all. I'm a librarian's kid. I even have, have all the demo cassettes we got. Have you ever gone in a record store and walked out with nothing when you had money in your pocket? Yeah. I have, especially if it's the hipster what? store what? in a town I'm, I'm told to go to, and there isn't anything that interesting. They have every indie and punk label in the book except Alternative Tentacles. And I'm like, okay, bye-bye. No support from you, no support from me. No, 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 no. But it, it yeah. is rare, and there is a bad habit sometimes of getting something in a thrift store just because I didn't want to go out empty-handed. And then what did I buy this Mormon campfire songs record for? <laughs> and well, things this, like that. Well, you know, because uh, I, I, I saw you in the, uh, in, in the 
corporate play. What was that uh, documentary about the uh, corporate Broadway plays? And they made albums oh, yeah. of them. And apparently that was only that, that was only people like Broadway. you have these albums. Yes. Yeah, that movie is called Bathtubs Over, Over Broadway. And ironically, the people who made it call the those records and that whole genre um, industrial music. But we aren't talking about Nine Inch Nails or Ministry right. or Revco or whatever. We're talking about corporate sales conventions, souvenir albums, where executives or a little bit low salesmen would have a little executives and obviously romp without the wives there. And they would hire a composer and a performance troupe to perform a one-time only musical full length about how great the corporation is. And I think we need to of mine who made, increase the taxes on the corporations. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and some of these is Steve Young who made the movie, who was the main scholar of this and turned me on to it and even gave me an extra copy of the American standard toilet company convention one, which has my bathroom, my bathroom, is a special kind of place. Oh yeah, the, the the level of dementia is like nothing you have ever experienced. I'm really glad you saw that movie too, because uh, there was one example where the the original Fiddler on the Roof stage in the fifties four hundred thousand dollars to launch it on Broadway. Same year, a musical for con some kind of a convention about General Motors one point five million. And name actors came through on this. But you, the Steve, what Steve said to me in a letter was. His favorite ones were the ones that clearly were not meant to be heard outside the company, like a live, a Coca-Cola one and live in San Francisco in the big bottling plant in the sky where there's no EPA and there's no OHSA and everyone has to drink Coke all day. And I thought, wow, if they're that upset about the EPA who didn't exist that much earlier, what are they putting in Coke that would upset the EPA that much so yeah it, it's a it's a and, the, and now there's a there's a soundtrack album to it too with a whole bunch of the most demanded ones on there so bathtubs over broadway people and back to back to mojo okay now we have we haven't gotten to actually going live with skid roper yet the the early launch of mojo nixon so i played about five maybe ten shows by myself i think the first mojo show was coming up in the spring was 40 years ago at the Texas Tea House in Ocean Beach in San Diego. And uh, my buddy Mitch Cornish, uh, he used to play there. And some other bands used to play there. It was a little bitty place. And I played there just by myself, sitting down with the guitar, calling myself Mojo Nixon. So everybody thinks, you know, knows me as Kirby at the time. And uh, and I don't have that many, many songs, and I'm not that good, but I am extremely... You know, I'm extremely excited to do it. And there was a club in San Diego called The Spirit where, uh, you know, oh, most yeah. of the alt bands played. And uh, me and Skid would hang out there all the time. And I originally wanted him to play like one of those cocktail drums or just a snare. Uh, but he goes, okay. no, I'm in the Snuggle Bunnies, I have this washboard on a stick. And uh, and then we, we, I think we rehearsed two or three times. And then we started playing. Country Dick and the Snuggle Bunnies, uh, the band before the Beat Farmers, that both that Joey Harris was in and Nino was in. They uh, they used to play Spring Valley Inn every uh, every Sunday night, and then me and Skid, we, when they would take a break, we'd get up and play. Whether whether they were, we were allowed to or not, those guys were so drunk and so high they they couldn't say no. And and then me and Skid were in a bunch of other bands at the same. You know, I was in like four bands. Uh, but eventually they all fell away, and uh, you know I made a. Uh, I made a demo at Joey Harris's house. Joey Harris is later in the Beat Farmers. Joey's uncle, uh, Nick Reynolds, is in the Kingston Trio. We played. We did a uh, demo in Joey's house. Jo me and Skid and Joey and Paul Kamansky. Paul Kamansky is the one who wrote all the best songs in the Beat Farmers. He's Joey's running mate from Coronado. And uh, we made the demo. And eventually, the guy in the record company, the guy, Ron Gowdy, gets hold of He goes, oh, we're putting this out. I go, no, no, those are just demos. He goes, no, nah, no. Nah. You can make a better album next time. I'm putting this out. You can't. There's no way you. There's no way you can sound this primitive again. And like on that first album, people would say, "Man, it sounded like you know, like primitive musicians. Like you know, how did you play? How did you, essentially they're saying, how did you play so shittily? You know, like a skiffle band. And I was like, 
That was as good as I could play. That was the top end of my ability. <laughs> and this was long before do rag and then the whole gut bucket blues lo fi right. thing by maybe 15 or 20 years. I mean, you know, uh, what Eugene Chadbourne was doing a crazy thing. And, oh, yeah. Right. There were other, other nuts, uh, you know, free spirits doing things. And I didn't As really know what I was doing. Right. I, I didn't really know what I was doing. I, I, I knew yeah. way down inside, I knew. I was not going to be good in the cubicle. I was not going to be good in the office. Right. You know. Right. Uh, so, so basically, that makes me wonder if your friend's uh, father was it, who was in the Kingston Trio, and knew Ron Gowdy from Enigma, would that, I would love to see if he first brought you in there and said, I found the new Kingston Trio. Sit down and listen <laughs> nah, nah, and then watch the look but, on the person's face. No, nah, because originally, because, uh, Enigma was, uh, I was on Enigma Records, was part of, uh, was it Green World? And they had like a metal label up in, up in yeah, the, they, in yeah, they broke off of Green World. The Hind Brothers pulled out of Green World and then started Enigma independently of that. There was a guy, there was an, another like a metal label, and this guy, he was managing Tex and the Horseheads. And I gave him a cassette, and he goes, this isn't for me, but he gave it to Ron. I can't remember his name. Oh, okay. But, not Brian Slade. Yeah, because right, sure. also, it, right, in San Diego and L.A., oh, the Steve whole Steve Sinclair. It was Steve Sinclair. Yeah, it Might was Steve, Steve Sinclair. Sinclair. That's who it was. Yeah. And, but the, the metal thing is happening simultaneously. You know, the hair metal. Right. You know, the, there's the devil metal, and there's also the hair metal. And that's all happening simultaneously in some of the same clubs, you know, in L.A. And I'm sure, you know, up in San Francisco, too. And I'm pretty sure Metal Blade was ma manufactured, distributed by Enigma originally. Yeah, that was Metal Blade. That's the one I'm thinking Seriously. of. Right. Yeah. And then Ron, yeah. he also, he signed uh, Poison. And he signed Striper, the Christian metal band that wore the right, Bumblebee right. suits. But he also <laughs> he signed the Dead Milkman. So I mean, you know, and he produced the you know first Dead Milkman, couple records, and he produced the first three records of mine, and he produced Elvis is Everywhere. You know, which is uh, wow. that, there might be eight guitar. I you know I'm playing every guitar part known to me. Every everything I know how to play is on that one song. And somehow, in spite of stuffing Martha's muffin, and you became an MTV darling, and even a, even an on air personality. Yeah, that had to do this. Uh, you know, they MTV wanted to be appear to be hip. It was this director guy, Mark Pellington. He was the one, and then um, who was the guy? Uh, uh, Jonathan Demme's uh, uh, nephew, Ted Demme. They. Like, you know, they were up and coming filmmakers and they got a job from MTV to do promos. And, you know, they picked me because they had already done like, you know, Randy of the Redwoods and other kind of slightly oddball things. And uh, I made all these demands. I won't I, I, I won't do it. You know, thinking they would, you know, cave. They gave in. <laughs> when, when the devil wants you, he wants you bad. <laughs> Right. I made all these demands that I wouldn't all these things I wouldn't do. And they had to do. And they agreed to all of them in five minutes. Fuck. Wow! I'm fucked. <laughs> and and were you were you a married man by then? No, but uh, we were. I'm sure we were living together. We got married uh, a couple of years later. A couple of years later, we got married at the go kart track in San Diego. And Country Dick uh, performed a wedding ceremony, and we had the 21 uh, three man water balloon slingshot salute. And we also took the victory lap that most go kart wedding couples take. My buddy Joe Longa, <laughs> uh, you know, was had the Hammond B3. He played all the, you know, hits. He played Green Onions. He played Double Shot of My Baby's Love. He played all the hits on the B3, including the wedding song. Did he play Sweet Soul Music by Arthur Conley? You told Sam uh, the movie that was a gateway drug into all this cool music that made you what you are today. Yeah, no, when I hear that song still, uh, you know, I don't know if you know this, but in the middle of the song, you can hear Otis talking. Otis Redding's producing Arthur Conley and Muscle Shoals. Right. And if you listen during the middle eight, during the bridge, uh, uh, Arthur says something like, hey, Otis, how am I doing? Off the mic. But you can hear it. And Otis, like on the talkback, goes, yeah, man, sounds great. <laughs> I'll have to listen for that next time. Yeah, so it's that... it's kind of like, you know, at the end of uh, Fingertips Part 2, 
There's a guy yelling, what key? Have you ever heard that? The no. Stevie Wonder harmonica song? Yeah, so it, the, the, he I comes back. That. I don't know about the, the Sanders. The, so, the song ends. The, he's playing. He's, he comes back, and they got, like, the Motown orchestra on stage. The Stevie, it, one, the Stevie's blind, and he's got, like, three harmonicas. So they don't know what key he's in. And and you can hear one guy going, what key? What key? What key? He doesn't say what key, motherfucker, but that's that's what it sounds like he's about to say. Uh, 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 uh. You wow. know, I am full of odd bullshit. <laughs> oh, I know. That's why you're on Renegade Roundtable. You know, we, 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 we could listen to all this all day. After all, since it's a streaming thing, you can always halt and then get back to it later. Or the traffic jam you're in every day trying to get home from work in L.A. because they destroyed the mass transit system decades ago the LA and interurban rail you could listen to the whole thing and the traffic jam and the pain is not is lessened for the day hopefully although the one thing i really miss about those traffic jams on the 405 going north actually you remember this sign too you have to remember this sign it shows the sky at the wheels and it's pink and neon blue and it says diarrhea the last mile is the longest Pepto Bismol. You know what I'm talking about, right? Woo! <laughs> yeah, that's. And I can't that believe like my life Ed Culver on... never took a picture of it. Yeah, that sounds like my life uh, on tour. We we got to <laughs> stop. We got to stop now, right now. Did you decide you wanted to get off the road, more time with family, whatever? Because you're a grandpa now, even Grandpa Mojo, and uh, you'd make a great Santa Claus too. And a, if you haven't done that yet, but uh, you'd be a great Santa Claus. But anyway, did you get the serious? Well, you you were you got you were you were a seriously skilled broadcast personality, AM radio, even before Sirius even existed. How did that get going? You know, at some point, uh, you know, I, I realized if I stayed on the road, uh, if I stayed on the road and did it the way I usually did it, I'd be dead. So I decided, and I'd made ten albums. Isn't that enough? And and uh, you know, it's one thing. One thing Bullet Head always says: if Country Dick was alive, Mojo would be dead. Because you know, I would have tried to help you know do Country Dick. And um, I got a job. Uh, I got a, I got a job on the radio here in Cincinnati. Uh, you know, doing radio because in San Diego nobody would hire me because they all believed the myth of Mojo. They thought I lived in a van down by the river. You know, lived on Crank and Mad Dog Twenty Twenty. There's a little truth to that, but you know, anyway. So I got a job on the radio here, and then I've now been working at Sirius XM for 20 years. You would think I'd have been fired. You'd have think I'd have said something at some point, and it got me fired, you know. Uh, every time I'd play George Jones, I'd think, George Jones, sing so good, make your dick hard. Mojo Dixon, hello, country. So uh, I've been doing Outlaw Country uh, for good 18 years now. I just signed a deal to do two more years. And it's Channel 60. I'm on in the afternoons. Uh, what is that? Let's see. It's uh, 4 to 8 East, uh, 1 to 5 West. And it's Hillbilly Rock and Roll. It's Country Rock. Whatever you, you know, it's got a million, it's got a million different names. Is it weekly? But, uh, you know, it's weekly? Two rock and roll. Daily? Daily. Is it weekly? Every, Daily? Weekdays. Yeah, weekdays. And then on Monday night, I have a NASCAR show uh, called, wait a minute. Destiny. I got a NASCAR show called Manifold Destiny because I am a hillbilly from Danville, Virginia. Yeah, I'm glad NASCAR. you said it twice because you said that so loud and leaned so far into your microphone, whatever kind it is, it completely put you underwater. <laughs> the, uh, but Manifold Destiny is on, and I used to have the talk show, Lion Cocksuckers, that I had you on a couple of times. Uh, you know, and I, and, and like, it, you know, but it, it, I'm being paid not to do that. But I, you know, I have to say, yeah. I was uh, listening to some uh, tapes. I was driving back from North Carolina here recently, and I stole a whole lot of my you know, stuff from Richard Pryor and Bill Hicks. You take the best of Richard Pryor and the best of Bill Hicks, and you, and you, get, you get a little oh, jump. Oh, oh, and you mentioned the movie. The movie will be coming out next year in 2023, hopefully uh, in the first quarter, and you'll be able to stream it. You'll either be able to see it on on demand or on Amazon or Netflix or something. And here's the crazy thing about the movie: it doesn't suck. It is it's, sh it's shocking. It's shocking that the movie no, does. It certainly does. I think if you're a Mojo fan, you'll like the movie. It's called the Mojo Manifesto. Oh yeah. 
So now um, you live in Ohio, which is a pretty gnarly state when it comes to uh, the real vote fraud, you know, depriving more and more people of voting. And you come from another one in North Carolina, and you're very familiar with that. How do we make sure somebody like J.D. Vance is not a senator? in two or three weeks, for example. Yeah, I, I told my wife, we got to go, we're going on this cruise, on this Outlaw West cruise. We got to go vote before, before we leave. And she was like, well, why do I have to vote for him? I said, well, if you want your granddaughter to uh, be able to have an abortion, you got to vote, you got to vote for Tim Ryan. You know, and he, J.D. Vance, man, he's, a, you know, I'm mean, here in Ohio and they, he is so pitiful. He is such a bad candidate that he has to have his wife do his commercials. You know, he's got he's he, he he's got a he's got a wife. I think she's originally her parents are from India or somewhere, and uh, she's young and good looking. And uh, but he is such a jerk that he can't even right. He's so unlikable that he has to have his wife do his commercials. You know, and Tim Ryan, the guy that's running against him, has to you know he's banking to the middle. He's going to the middle. Because that because you he's going to need independents and Republicans to vote for him. you know Republicans in Ohio probably have a, an advantage of at least five percent. Well, and plus all the uh, gerrymandering and the tossing out of people's ballots because they have a oh, last yeah, no, name like um, Washington. Yeah, no, Ohio, they, Ohio is one of the worst, and of course this the Ohio is the state where W stole his second election in two thousand four. I'm not sure you were there then, or you were because you, you were back in San Diego for a while when you were still. Right, I think I had AM gone back. Right, that's right when I went back to San Diego. Uh, and yeah, I was working. Yeah. I was working working for Clear Channel on the classic rock station, playing Sticks and Journey. Small pieces of my soul were being chipped away each day. I'm lucky I found this job at uh, Sirius XM where I can say what I want, play what I want. Now I I I got to. I made a list of things we should change. You want to hear my list? These are things, structural changes that'll make things better. Absolutely. First off, that, we're getting ready. That, the elect that, we're getting ready. Here's the, the new Rojo Manifesto. Yes. The, 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 we're getting ready I assume the it's a voting college. and lifestyle guide. Okay, go ahead. I'll shut up. <laughs> we're getting rid of the electoral college. That's going to do two things. Person with the most votes wins the presidency. Two, it'll allow second and third and fourth parties to emerge. Under the Electoral College, if it was winner take all, you could get 33% of the vote and it doesn't, you don't get nothing. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to get rid of the 60, 60 vote rule in the Senate. That's not in the Constitution. We can get rid of that tomorrow. We're going to end safe gerrymandering. We use natural borders to figure out congressional districts. And if there's a question about, you know, what, what, what should we do? We should make it so that it's more even. The the best congressional district would be one that's 50-50, 50, you know, uh, ideally 50% Republican, 50% Democrat. And then guess what? We, would, we wouldn't be electing Marjorie Taylor Greene. We'd be electing moderates who wanted to govern, not assholes who want, you know, who wanted to go up there and be jerks. The next thing with 18-year terms in both the House and the Senate, voting should be easy often. Uh, it should be a holiday. It should be, it should be like going to the ATM. Uh, the top 10 states in uh, top 10 states in population get an extra senator. Bottom 10 states lose a senator. Uh, we're going to get rid of the one person cut block in the Senate. We're going to take the money out of the campaigns. Everybody knows right now the Democrats and Republicans are bought and paid for before they get to Washington. We should have a campaign of ideas, not about raising money. The Supreme Court should be a 20 year term. Uh, and we we appoint. I was going to say eighteen. Uh, eighteen, you go right because of the number. Twenty uh, term. You have a, you have a new appointments every two years. And this was a little controversial. I think we need a fifteen percent flat tax on everybody, no exceptions, no nothing. If you're going to pay, so here's the thing: the people that are making the most money are taxed at a higher rate. But they end up the, the actual rate they pay is nowhere close to fifteen percent. If you let's say you made four million dollars, you had four million dollars in money last year. If we got fifteen percent of four million or forty million or four billion, then we would have tons more money. And speaking of that money, first thing we're going to do is cut the defense budget in half. We're going to cut the defense budget in half, and we're going to get a hard line between the church and the state. And speaking of taxes. 
half church has got to pay taxes and health care is going to be a right and we're going to legalize all drugs tomorrow not just the illegal ones the ones in the pharmacy too and we're going to you know buying a gun should be like owning a boat you got to take a class you got to take a class and you got to you got to show up you know, and not be crazy oh and guess what we're going to do something about climate change and we're going to make abortion safe and legal vote mojo uh, but vote Mojo for president on the Mushroom Party. Oh, there you go. Yeah, there was close to that in Canada, and they got some parliament seats at one point. It grew out of a ban, too. But uh, I, I'm with you on everything except the flat tax. I think for upper income people, great. But if you have only made or even netted $10,000 a year, and you lose fifteen hundred bucks. That is a very serious. No, I think you cut. you would you could have a, a minimum. You could have a minimum cut off. Everybody under four, you know forty thousand or something doesn't have to pay any taxes. The, my main concern here is the tax system has got so many loopholes. You're right. If you if you make if you have uh, four million dollars or four billion dollars, you can hire enough tax lawyers and accountants to where your net your real tax rate ends up being. You know, I don't know, two percent or something, and I or I, zero I, if you're Donald Trump. And yeah. uh, oh, and there's one other thing I wanted to talk about: the Queen. I fucking hate the Queen. I'm glad she's dead. I don't know why anybody in America gives a flying fuck about the Queen. What did the Queen? Did the Queen cure cancer? Did she end childhood poverty in England? Did you know uh, the Queen? What did she do? Here's what she did. She was one. She was born. She was sperm lucky. And two, she wasn't as fucked up and shitty as the rest of her family. Fuck that old lady. I hate the queen. <laughs> I I like them. I like them. I like I don't like hereditary, you know, uh, people inheriting fucking wealth and power. Fuck the queen. Uh, anything else you want to talk about, Jello? <laughs> <laughs> well, at the very least, there should not be any more of the citizens taxes going to subsidize a royal family that rich and everything but you're forgetting one thing that some people claim the queen accomplished a, you remember a much earlier crackpot conspiracy theory person who got through to ed meese with one of his lieutenants and star wars was announced the next day without right. by reagan without consulting the defense department you know who we're talking about here the guy who wanted particle beam weapons and this and that lyndon larouche he also went on and on for years that the entire world drug trade was being run by Queen Elizabeth. And with, it's one of those conspiracy theories, like somebody else, like just like think, wow, if only that really was true. But were you saying when I got high on illegal drugs, I was snorting up, the queen was getting a little profit from my snortology? Well, Lyndon LaRouche thinks so, but we don't know how many drugs he's been, he was on all those years to come up with this stuff, oh, let alone be able to manipulate so many people to make him wealthy. Well, I had one other thing I wanted to mention uh, about the war in the Ukraine. You hear a lot of people talking about war crimes. You know, that's a war. They're committing war. War is a crime. War is always killing and murder and raping and burning, and civilians always get killed. The crime is, is, is having a war. The, the idea that one type of killing is worse or different than some other killing, when you're dead, you're fucking dead. I just think, you know, war is the crime. They're, you know, not what type of weapon you use, whether or not you used an arrow or a knife or even a, even a poison gas or a nuclear bomb. The problem is killing people. The killing people. War is all. Look, you can say that uh, we had to fight Hitler to keep him from taking over the world. It's still murder. What we did was murder. And, you, know, they, you, know, you hear all this talk about our troops. What are our troops? Our troops are our paid murderers. They're our paid thugs to go over there and kill some brown people. You know, and, and anyway, this whole idea, you know, uh, uh, they're committing war crimes. Bullshit. And war is a crime. War is murder. It's, you know, anyway. I just... Well, that, that, that's very, very well said. And I've never heard anybody say it quite like that before. Thank you. Okay, let's have some more now. Let's have some, some more of your ideas. I mean, well, what, you know, you, you I have remember, a lot of books. I, I think, I don't know if this was in Steal This Book or someone had uh, given it to me and wrote it in there, but I, it might have been in Steal This Book. Killing for peace is like fucking for virginity. 
you know. In the <laughs> that's a good way of putting it. That's a it real. Might have, that, that might have been, been Abby Hoffman. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Maybe what I should do for a future Renegade Roundtable is go over the quotes in that book and then turn it to ha have it following questions, and I can interview his ghost. Would be good. You know, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Somebody, somebody. When I was in high school, somebody gave me steal this book, and somebody else gave me uh, fear and loathing. And I was like, yeah, I, and I knew that I wasn't going to be sticking around Danville much longer. <laughs> okay, you got any other good ones? No, I think I got. I think I got everything on there. Uh, uh, I did a big rant when uh, the the band played, and I did a rant about Queen of England uh, in Wichita. We we, uh, the, we showed the movie in Wichita at a film festival, the Tall Grass Film Festival, and then the get, huh. band played afterwards. And people laughed at the movie; they laughed in the right places. It went good. But when I went on my psychotic, hate-filled rant about the Queen, I could tell I was making some people. Feel, it it really makes me happy. You know, if I can make people wildly uncomfortable, I'm doing my job. <laughs> oh, fully agreed. Here, here. I'll give you a little uh, a fist pump on the computer without trying to bonk the computer and screw up the audio. And you know, uh, Mojo could fuck up a one-man rock fight. Mojo could tear up an anvil. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds like Mojo occasionally is playing with the real toad lickers again. Yes, we uh, and in fact, uh, yeah, we're going to play on this Outlaw Country cruise, and we'll play. And there's another cruise next year, and I play this show down in Austin at South by Southwest at the Continental Club. I host this party, and we play at the end. And I'm trying, I'm trying to get the to make it the last show. I've been doing it for over 20 years, a couple of years there was because of COVID, and I was hoping to get the Beat Farmers, NRBQ, the Waco Brothers, and the Yahoos. To, to play and that would be like the big the, the old man you know old man three chord rock and roll thank y'all for coming uh but i'm working on that that might be at uh, steve wertheimer's continental club well, down there in uh Austin, i warn Texas. you now i warn <laughs> you now when more people see that movie and see the live shows not just you as a younger guy full of energy and fire and brimstone but the power of the music itself and that there's nobody there hasn't been anybody else quite like that since so once that movie gets around you, bullethead is going to get so many people promoters bookers whatever clamoring to get you back in venues well that yeah and, this and, is and when at i least die some, like short at... tours tours yeah, i think we can maybe I, play and, two or three shows you know we might be able to play like you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, maybe, uh, uh, you know, in a row. But that's when I die in Des Moines, Iowa, uh, in a motel room with what I thought was crank or cocaine, but I was actually snorting borax. And, it, you know, and it says in the paper, almost famous musician, you know, dies on big comeback tour. Because, look, anybody can play Friday night in San Francisco at Slim's or whatever the equivalent is. It's Tuesday Slim's night in Des Moines. Gone, That's the hard work. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, I have never gotten a gig in Des Moines in my life. Iowa oh, State never, University, never, University I, of Iowa, yeah. But now you're Even right. Got, uh, hopefully what will happen is that people will see the movie. Uh, you know, it'll get a little underground buzz among the weirdos. And then uh, – There'll be hope, you know, somebody will say, yeah, can you play these three shows? We, you know, we'll, we'll go out and play, uh, you know, uh, 20 shows or something. And then that'll be it. Then I can say, okay, that's enough. Stop it. You could do your own mojo cruises on the road and rent a big old bus with some bunks in it or have hotels. And then you have a certain group of fans who are willing to pay you. Uh, you know, a ticket price, you'd make money and make it all worth it. And then not only will they get to see you in venues, but you'd be serenading them on the bus too. Uh, Just so yeah. long as you're well, not driving. You, yeah, no, nah, you don't want me to drive. Yeah, well, you know, that's kind of, you know, on the, on the cruise, you know, half the people on there hear me on the radio, you know, every day, you know, like when they're driving home. So at some point, uh, you know, I run out of shit to say. 
first couple of days, I'm, you know, I'm shaking hands, I'm kissing babies, I'm telling stories. But by the fourth day, I can't remember what story I've told to who. And, you know, I started losing my mind. It, it's getting hard. It's hard being Mojo. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're still willing to work hard and you've still got that energy and fire and brimstone and metabolism. So if any of those little weekend tours, and even a lot of older punk bands do that now because of families and jobs and other things they'll do two or three shows and then they go home and sometimes they mainly do them festivals and stuff but um yeah, that's where the if, you're, is, right? if you're open to doing that then for crying out loud the bay area awaits or if i'm back in colorado then of course that awaits as well and then we can all go track down Dwayne, <laughs> roust him out of his bed on that on that note I think we've done a good rounded hour and a half. So uh, thank you once again. And if there's all kinds of other things you really wanted to say, record yourself and send it to us as an addendum. And we'll put that in too. In the meantime, you know, to quote Mojo Nixon on the, you can't kill me, I will not die. I mean, people need that every once in a while and they're, lower moments very much including me so adios amigos hey jello thanks thanks a lot for having me and uh and uh, i'll see you soon <laughs>